All right, Raphael. Well, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. We have had some stellar conversations the last few months and, and really getting to, to know each other's path and, and know each other's journey a little bit and, and thoughts about what we want to do in the future, you know, individually and perhaps even um, together in some form or fashion. So really, really happy to get into to your journey and, and your sort of mission and vision right now. Um, but just a caveat to all this, why, why we're doing sort of this recording is that Raphael is going to be doing some co-hosting with me on Disruptors for Good, investing in impact. He'll have some of his, his own episodes as um, he's going to be interviewing uh, founders and investors sort of face to face and he's in Singapore. So we get sort of a lens of what's going on uh, on that side of the world as well. Um, so I wanted to kind of introduce uh, Raph to, to all of us and, and kind of just talk a little bit about his journey uh, before he starts to 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 hear you before you start to hear his voice a little more so just talk about your journey my man this maybe you can start after college if you want to go that far back um your time <laughs> at blackberry and, and, and kind of your time as the angel investor cool. let's go through the whole course right now Sure, and, and thanks so much for, for, first of all, having me on the show, Grant, because, um, you know, I've enjoyed so many of the podcasts on Disruptors for Good and Investing in Impact. You know, I, I've been going on this journey and, you know, one of the things you're always doing is kind of searching, looking for content as you kind of research and understand um, an ecosystem or a scene or a community. And so outstanding work for, for what you've been doing over, you know, many years those resources have, have been something that I've tapped into many times and listened to. So first of all, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm also extremely excited about helping you out and working on um, in, interviewing some of the incredible stuff that's happening out here in Southeast Asia. Uh, because, you know, one of the things I enjoyed about listening to the podcast is really just seeing the kind of breadth of amazing people that are working on solutions to like big problems in really innovative ways. I find it really inspiring. And that's partly why I'm kind of moving my whole career in, in, in this direction. But I'll start, I guess, yeah, after college, why not? Um, <laughs> so basically, I, I graduated and I decided to move to London because, you know, the streets are paved with gold. I mean, really up, up, up to then, <laughs> up to then, my kind of, you know, one of the things I'd done was a, a year in industry and everybody, you know, that I interviewed through that pro that program, it was a special scheme, sort of actually pre, pre university. Um, everybody seemed to have a degree, and all of them, it didn't seem to matter what degree you had. You could be an accountant with like French and German or something, um, but everybody had a degree. And that's how I actually learned about university. I, I'm not from like a long line of uh, university. Um, uh, family etc so I kind of went to went to uni based on that year in industry because I realized it was something I really needed to have and then from there I, I was a little bit cocky and, and kind of wanted to move into an area in sales and or sales and marketing I realized was where CEOs seem to have a good grounding um, or was a domain especially that they seem to kind of excel from or come from and so I actually worked for a company called MCI Worldcom which was uh Oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, communi it was a communications company. It was a telecoms company. It was a guy called Bernie Evers, who was a, a basketball coach in the US who started buying up all these Bell telephone companies. And it kind of went on to be a scandal. So it's uh, it's worth a look in if you like your kind of Enrons and uh, Theranoses and, and those kind of things. So it, it kind of didn't didn't end up great. But I missed out. I missed all of that stuff, of course. Uh, I was just basically a business development person. I started working in, in telecoms and very quickly had to um, pivot somewhat because nobody in the city of London was caring about having cheaper phone calls, but they were caring about having um, data connections and, and um, you know, VPNs. And so I, I kind of started out actually as just a sales guy in telecoms. And then, of course, all this stuff happened in, in, in telecoms. You had the dot-com boom in 2000, you know, just after I graduated. You know, that was kind of like a, a big reset, but what was exploding was mobile and I was super interested in, in, in that. And so I kind of had a few, a few jobs in, in telcos and um, BlackBerry was the first company where I had used that, used their product and just gone, oh, this is going to change everything. This is, you know, awesome. And I want to work for this company. And so Fortunately, you know, I got the opportunity. I was, you know, direct, directly got in touch with, um, you know, I was selling Blackberries at the time when I was at the telcos and stuff. And I was also using a Blackberry and 
it sounds stupid now, <laughs> but like yeah. The but, idea I mean, so this is what like, early early two thousands or this is about two thousand and seven, I guess, or early okay. yeah, but maybe around that time. And yeah, mobile email was. Yeah. Well, I was using Blackberries long before that, but all the first ones, right, where you couldn't even use it as a phone, it kind of, um, uh, well, the first ones were like a pager, but then you could use a phone if you had a headset plugged into it, um, which didn't really work work out. But, but you know, they, Blackberry was a super interesting company. It was incredibly innovative. There's so much Blackberry technology that is kind of just in the whole architecture of telecoms. They contributed to Bluetooth. They contributed to lots of different standards. And now, of course, you know, everyone's, holding iPhones or Samsungs or Huawei's or whatever, but there's still BlackBerry in the world. It's still managing tons of enterprise iPhones and, and other things, right? Because what they did super well was sort of understanding the importance of security and all that side. But I mean, it's a, just a case study in itself, BlackBerry, if you like, because, um, you know, we talk about innovation and, 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 you know, strategic decisions and growing businesses. Well, you know, there was so many learnings from BlackBerry and just, yeah, you know, I came into the business in, I uh, worked in the UK. I, I was probably employee, like, I think I was early 4,000s and now, and then by the time I left, there's about 16,000 people. And it was super interesting to see how that company evolved because it was, you know, initially just kind of business people using that tool. And then, you know, I distinctly remember being on a tube one day in London and just realizing that with the cheaper devices that they they created like the Pearl and the Curve and things. They managed to connect through actually BlackBerry Messenger, BBM, yep. to a much, much younger audience. Because at the time, like it, it was a uh, 10 pence or something like that for, mm -hmm. uh, for a text message. And of course, you had read receipts with BBM. So, and it was basically, you know, free essentially as part of your data plan. So it exploded. And I remember thinking, this is weird. Like you've got like 16 year olds and, and like teenagers in the same car of a, of a tube train, mm -hmm. you know, riding and using Blackberries <laughs> at the same time as you've got all these kind of business people. So that was the kind of the peak, I guess. But obviously we'll come back to this, I guess, in a way, because you're, how you make your money is super important, like your primary sources of revenue. And although BlackBerry, you know, had this kind of data plan, most of their money came from selling handsets. So mm. that meant that yeah. actually how do you sell more handsets becomes your primary focus. And I think the other sort of interesting learning is around philosophy. If you have limiting beliefs or if you have beliefs that are kind of not, you know, don't pull, you know, come through you're going to end up with businesses that, that fall over based on your founding beliefs or those limiting beliefs that you have. And there was a few, I think, um, that, you know, were, were prevalent there. You know, the, the thought that you needed to have a keyboard, you know, is potentially one. The thought right. that, you know, consumers had to have like an end-to-end -end <laughs> thing was maybe another. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, it was super interesting when, when iPhone launched, you know, that, that, were you still there you were still there when it launched yeah i was still okay. there actually like it was a super interesting moment because apple came in and they they did took the opp opposite approach to to blackberry blackberry had lots of people looking at the different channels the the, the different telcos and and i was dead you know dedicated at that time working with vodafone uh, um actually vodafone global enterprise which is kind of a part of Vodafone that they created to better look after hmm. their cust their kind of global customers. And they had millions of uh, Blackberries, as you can imagine, because of all the, the banks and financial services and lawyers and all those kind of uh, people using them. And um, yeah, it came in and actually it didn't really make that any dent on the growth of Blackberry um, with the first iPhone. Um, but what happened was uh, and this is the genius, I guess, of Steve Jobs and, and what they did was it kind of um, did to, to BlackBerry what uh, BlackBerry had done to Nokia in a way, because very soon the CEOs, the, the kind of really senior people were like, hey, um, this iPhone thing's cool. I want one. And they uh, go to their, yeah. their security guy, right? they go to their IT guy and say, get me an iPhone. And the IT guy would say, well, hold on. Um, we don't know how to lock this thing down. It's not secure. You're going to, you know, at this point, Obama's using a BlackBerry, you know, there's, it's just not possible. And um, there's only one winner when, when a CEO really wants something. So they just had the problem of like, work out how to fix it. I want one right now. And when they 
you know, finally capitulated or, or worked out how they could do some form of device management, that's felt, you know, a very early signal that there was going to be a problem because it's going to trickle down in the organization a bit like BlackBerry kind of trickled down from, you know, the, the first people that saw it on a, on a business class flight, you know, to New York or whatever, and saw the guy kind of responding on this small device. It's kind right, of a similar right. thing, but, it, but I think iPhone just had obviously way more cool factor and, um, you know, BlackBerry kind of at that time was very immersed in this kind of end to end philosophy. Um, if we'd have gone, or when I say we, if, if the company had gone, you know, had made BBM cross platform, you wouldn't really have needed a WhatsApp because BBM <laughs> kind of did all that. So, you know, WhatsApp went on to be like worth 23 billion or, or whatever or bought for. Um, so it's kind of crazy, really, how these decisions can make such a, a massive impact when you get to get to the kind of that level. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I remember, I never had a BlackBerry, but I remember them being sort of very prevalent, you know, adults, right? Like that, that's what, like you said, it, it started to get into the to younger environment, but then, you know, iPhone came and then it was like the uh, T-Mobile sidekick was like huge. And then Motorola had, I think they kind of had sort of a younger audience with some of like the, the products that they had early on. The thing that changed everything, because even when the iPhone came out, I remember uh, HP had bought Palm and they had released uh, this HP phone. I don't know if you remember this, but it was, I think it was the HP Palm maybe, but it was the first one. Now we all know the iPhone, you can kind of double click and swipe up the cards, right? To close the apps. But that that wasn't, iOS didn't like event. That wasn't an Apple thing. That was the HP um, Palm OS system. Yeah. And I had that phone. I was like, this is an amazing <laughs> phone. Like, I am never getting an iPhone. Like, this stupid. Like, <laughs> iPhone was like way worse than this. But the, the issue that uh, I saw so early on that none of these companies who were building iOSs for, for mobile, and, and the same with Microsoft when they happen, same with Amazon when they try to do phones, nobody did the App Store. You know, and I yeah. thought HP, I was like, why didn't Palm OS just go to, you can easily, like, everybody can go look at the top 10 apps on, on the iPhone app store right now. I was like, just go to those developers and say, Hey, would you want to, we'll allow you to come on here. We'll give you, we'll give you 90% of the revenue, right? Whatever it is, a hundred percent, whatever, just to build after our <laughs> OS. <Good luck. laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that's what happened is it's a, the, the HP device, it just, the, the app store was just irrelevant. Nobody was developing on it. And so it just became like a really cool way to like call people and text message people and maybe yeah. watch some, some internet stuff. But like, as you saw the app store exploding, I was like, if you're going to launch, and then it, Microsoft kind of had the same issue. Amazon, yeah. when they released their phone, they didn't really have a robust app store. And this is when there was millions of apps out. Like it could have been robust because they were more focused on like the ecosystem of having their brand and kind of you being embedded in their ecosystem. Man, it just seemed like such a huge and obvious thing that each one of these companies kept making a mistake of. Um, it does now, definitely. I, the 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 thing I you know it was the nail in the coffin. I think in a way the the the. But if you look at obviously Apple had the Mac. So they're, they're coming from a computing, mm -hmm. a computing sure. mindset, right? And, and you, need, you need to have connectivity, you need applications. That's the value of your computer. And, but the things that you had to do to overcome, you know, what was smart about the BlackBerry uh, originally was that it could, you could get all this email and everything over two, yeah. G, two, and, two and a half G, right. Right? right? Like not even 3G. <laughs> so it did, it kind of, you know, had to compress everything. Um, and now, yeah. you know, we don't have to even think about that. We've got 5G rolling out in places, right? It's, it doesn't matter if you've got lots of overhead, et cetera. But that philosophy, you know, what I guess, you know, they could see was that by turning, evolving the podcast, uh, the, uh, sorry, the iPod into the iPhone, and then, you know, the, the beauty of Moore's law, like you get more and more processing power, et cetera, the same was kind of happening around um, spectrum, you know, the, the way that we send all this data. So it, yeah, it, it kind of, I agree though, the app store was just, you know, the, the thing I think that was, you know, there was a time, I'm just trying to think when it was, it was probably around in 20, roughly when I came to Singapore, actually, it's probably around the 2010s. 
I couldn't go, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing an Apple app being advertised. So, you know, when something's got really big, it's kind of when, when you kind of walk past a store and they're, they're selling somebody else's products that they, they have an yeah. app on, right? And yep. that's the same a little bit like Facebook, you know, I've, I've seen kind of retailers, um, you know, they put facebook.com forward slash or whatever yep. there, there. And I'm like, why would you give that agency to... <laughs> To like, why would you give away? Send them to your own domain name. I yeah, know. It's like still, it's. it's still, it, yeah. I found it amazing, and and at that point, kind of, iPhone had taken over. But I think at that point, I'd also kind of got a slightly uh, been promoted. Was able to kind of um, ask questions on behalf of the the customers that that I was you know um, working with, and realizing that actually. It's probably not the right time for 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 me to be here anymore because I, I I just couldn't see um, the philosophy or, or yeah. things you know playing out um, playing out well. So so that was the catalyst to go to Singapore, or did you work for BlackBerry um, yeah, in I, Singapore? I worked. No, I worked. I did come out to Singapore where, when I was with BlackBerry. So um, and actually a long time ago, before then, in two thousand and one, I, I, I worked for Singtel briefly, and so I actually came out to Singapore in two thousand one gotcha. for a couple of weeks. And I can tell you now, it's it's pretty unrecognizable <laughs> um, in in twenty years. Um, you know, whole Marina Bay area. You've probably seen if you've watched like the F one or whatever. Whenever you see yeah. Singapore with this kind of um marina bay sands like a very kind of iconic building with three towers and a, what looks like a bendy kind of cruise liner or uh, sitting on top of them um you know that didn't exist the marina didn't exist they've been reclaiming land and and um you know all of that all of that came later but yeah in 2013 basically i i'd actually been chatting with a canadian guy who uh, we connected because I guess he he was Canadian, he loved Blackberry, and, and, and we had wives. Uh, sorry, wives. I didn't have a wife. Uh, we had uh, I had a girlfriend, and he had a wife at the time who um, who were both into horses, right? Which which neither of us were, and so we'd go um, and support them, and then I'd uh, I'd chat with him, and and for some time he'd been trying to convince me to join this company, and it was a private equity company, which I was super interested in. Um, but the killer blow really was that he had one of his, one of the managing, uh, well, one of the partners basically um, in that company was John Scully, the former Apple CEO and Pepsi uh, co CEO, and he he uh, was sending stuff to Shane, just like super insightful, fascinating emails. And Shane's strategy to onboard me was simply to forward these uh, insights from John. And um, I have to say it worked because I kind of got to the point where. I was like, why am I, why am I holding back? Why am I, um, cause I didn't, I guess the reason I was holding back was cause I didn't think I was fully qualified or qualified enough to, to work in a finance role when I hadn't got a CFA or, or, or you know, kind of that right. stuff. But Shane was kind of one of these um, guys who, who didn't want someone, his words were, I think like, I don't want those guys because they're already ingrained in a certain way of thinking. And they're going to tell me that this can't be done. And um, what we're going to do, it can be done. And, and, and what that involved was they were basically um, buying distribution businesses. So not that far from, you know, if you think of any mobile or any computer, or whatever, it's got to get to, right. um, it's got to get to the stores. It's got to get to you. And these companies, these distribution businesses, they um, work on ex extremely low margins and they have to be really efficient. But at this time, this company was kind of buying these up to try and create economies of scale and also realizing that they kind of separate the part of the company which has to finance everything, all the stuff in the warehouse and all the invoices, invoices et cetera. They were looking at financial tools to basically optimize that. And then the remaining part of the business is essentially like a FedEx, you're moving stuff around from, from, you know, uh, manufacturers to um, uh, consumers. So um, I joined in 2013, I came out to Singapore. And uh, that was my first kind of foray into financial services or finance. And that has set you down a track of, of angel investing and now impact investing and, and looking at the world through through that lens. But I guess talk about your your foray into angel investing, right? And looking at you know startups and and kind of understanding the vision that it takes and sort of the drive it takes sure. to really you know build an amazing company and seeing that right in founders or, or in ideas. Um, eventually, I 
I, I kind of am in the same position you were. I don't have, you know, a finance background, but it fascinates me. You know, the, yep. the allocators of capital, um, I think, have a real responsibility to really move forward specific type of companies that the world will use and, and you know, and function with, right? I mean, we, you know, we yep. deal with companies every day in our lives, even if we don't know it or realize it. Um, but I guess talk about your your journey into, you know, venture and being an angel investor. How did that first sort of, uh, you know, come about, into your life? Yeah, it came about sort of after I did about three years with these guys um, out in Singapore, I had the opportunity to join a, a venture firm, like an investment firm. Um, and I jumped at it because I think private equity is super, you know, ideal. If you're, if you really want to make a lot of money, you can go into private equity and it's like financial alchemy, essentially, if you're in the right position or, or if you've got the right product. And, you know, I'd put finance, I think a little bit on a pedestal in that I felt that I was quite nervous going into it. But once you kind of like with any industry change, once you start to under, understand all the TLAs, the three letter acronyms that everyone's firing around and, and can learn the language a little bit and, and peel kind of back the layers of the onion, you kind of at its core finance is actually sales and, and business development uh, to me, at least because it can be easier to raise a hundred million than it can be to raise 1 million. It really depends on who you're sat in front of, what their KPI is, and um, whether or not you're you're helping reach that KPI. So, so yeah, I I got the opportunity to to move, and and I jumped at it because I'm I'm much more inclined to focus on, um, you know, I'm I'm fascinated by technology. I'm fascinated by small teams working around, you know, big goals. Um, we had a sort of entrepreneurial venture that we that we forayed into actually into mobile again where, while i was at um inflection point was the name of the company and that was called ob mobiles which was a, a kind of um smartphone again unfortunately i thought i was leaving telco and i didn't quite manage it um but we we did a sort of smartphone for emerging markets right so we raised some money and uh and 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 had them designed using john's connections um super interesting team called ammunition design based out of san francisco and, and at that time their model was kind of do the design work but also take some equity so they actually did beats by dre which was um i think they had three percent of that which ended up getting acquired by apple so um that was a pretty good outcome for them so unfortunately this one didn't go quite as well as beats by dre so but in that experience, it kind of reignited my um, passion for small teams and for entrepreneurial um, endeavors. And um, then I started with a company called Ventures One, basically, who, who aren't like fully VC, because I, I guess VC is venture capital. It means you're, you're raising a fund. Um, you're using other people's money. This, these guys were actually entrepreneurs, had some exits, and then put that money into a portfolio of companies. So in a way, it's kind of better um, because they had a lot of um, control and, and you can decide completely what you want to do. There's no specific thesis, et cetera. But also it's a tricky thing because you get to a certain point and you, you kind of have deployed all your capital and then it's hard to scale without one of the companies that you've got having an exit. And during that period, basically, there was a number of deals, a number of things where I was like, oh, this is super, super interesting company. Um, you know, and, and it, it really started with um, Ventures One not investing and then me, you know, having a chat with the CEO at the time saying, do you mind if I invest? So that's how kind of angel investing um, piece came about was because once, you know, you have hundreds of decks coming across and, um, you know, your emails, et cetera. And once you start looking into some of these incredible teams and some of the things they're focusing on, it can't help but ignite excitement in you. It can't help but connect with you on opportunities that you do think are good quality. And I think the challenge is, I think one thing we have to do is kind of ignite or kind of enable this, democratize, if you want to use that word, it gets overused, but we have to make it easier for all kinds of people to have access to angel opportunities because I think that, you know, crowdfunding has a place and it's, it's, it's okay, but it's not the same as, as angel investing. And I think angel investing is so eye-opening. It, it's such a great experience. It's a two-way experience. It's not just kind of, it could be, you know, if you want it to be, you could just put money in and then forget about it. Sure. And, and, but actually there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of value exchange, which happens between angels and entrepreneurs, because 
once you own equity in something, once you kind of have put your own money into something, you care about it. And so you want to connect with that person. You want to understand, you know, what they're building, what the challenges are, help kind of overcome them. And that, that ownership piece is like significant. It, it's not the same as kind of being a mentor or a coach. Something switches, <laughs> like, I don't know what it is, but something, something definitely happens that makes you extremely, extremely aligned on something with someone else. And that's, super helpful for the startup it's also super helpful for the angel because you get exposure to really interesting companies or doing interesting things and you get to learn about different industries so you kind of you know end up with quite a wide um, gambit of things that you you have some form of um, knowledge about even though you're not like a specialist in any of them what are the things you can take away from that because as as we you know transfer into you know, impact investing and kind of what that means. I, I guess one is how did you, you know, come into impact investing? Just like, you know, you, you kind of found your way in, in sort of venture and angel investing. Now impact investing comes along, right? It sort of take it blends these philosophies of venture capital allocation of, of, of money and funds to certain places and has this layer now of, you know, mean a little bit more meaning behind it whether it's a sustainability lens, whether it's a, um, an education lens or a alleviation of, of poverty or, or food, uh, seeing a massive trans- transformation or, or climate and obviously environment. But there's all these things like, look, the companies that you fund have an impact on the world, whether it be negative, whether it be positive. And, and, you, and you sort of, you might not see those initial, you know, issues right away, right? But like, hey, if this company succeeds and they're in, you know, society for 30 years and affecting the environment for 30 years, is that going to be a really positive thing? You know, mm-hmm. even though the, the money returns and that value might be there, I think yeah. we're, we're coming into a place where we're looking at, we're assessing value differently, which is really interesting, mm-hmm. is which I really like and am fascinated by. But how did you come in, come into contact, I guess, with impact investing? And then I think we'll get into a little bit of, of how you're, you're looking at certain things. It's kind of a journey, I guess, um, in that, you know, I, w- I was I was investing, I'd invested in 2017, I, I led the investment into a company in the UK called Geospatial Insight, which is a super cool company, it, it, it takes uh, satellite earth observation data, and, you know, greenhouse gas information and all kinds of um, data points, and they have a sort of um, network of drone operators globally, right? And they ingest all this kind of uh, mostly visual data, and then they use machine learning to extract insights from it. So you can't help once you start kind of looking into those kinds of um, companies. And those, you, you know, one of the things they were doing, you know, they responded to over 80 uh, extreme events like cat events for, for insurers. So, you know, catastrophe happens. We've seen the hurricanes in North America, you know, fires in you know california australia there's floods all over the world and and so every time there's kind of one of these events uh the guys would spring into action and help the insurer understand instantly or almost instantly kind of what the losses are going to be and and then once you start doing that you start also sort of assessing things before those losses so you start working out oh well hold on we can actually understand how big a house is and, and extract the features using using AI, et cetera, to say, hey, this is a two-story house. It's got a gable roof and it's southwest facing and the, it's got tiles on the roof and all of this kind of information. So once you start kind of piecing all these things together, you can't help but notice permafrost <laughs> thawing in uh, Siberia. Like they, they've got incredible stuff that they're doing around peat monitoring. Peat holds like 3% of, um, well, it's 3% of the earth's surface, but it's, it holds more bigger carbon sink than all the forests or, or all of uh, the carbon on earth. So it kind of, you know, was part of the journey, but really I think it was, it was quite personal in that I was getting to a point, uh, I think it might be an age thing, partly where you get to a point where you just think, am I going to be a serial career person or am I going to create something or am I going to try, you know, what, what's the point of all of this beyond salary? You know, when I, when I graduated, I said, hey, what, you know, in my mind, my mindset was, oh, what's a growing industry or oh, technology I like? Okay, let's go over and let's start that thing. And what you don't realize is the dominoes that you start knocking over by that career choice is that 
you you know from a headhunting perspective you kind of you're gonna your next job they're gonna you know be a bit, bit, bit more money in a similar industry every recruiter kind of wants to put you in the next thing right and um in kind of making that big jump across from uh tel telecoms into finance i really learned that people are much more adaptable everybody you know we all have sets of skills and and we're stronger in some areas than others but it doesn't actually take that long to kind of gain um, an understanding because you can apply right. a lot of your 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 current understanding into anything yeah. and so I, i've done that and and then in vc i felt like wow i've really hit you know what i'm supposed to do and what i you know this is for me where it's at and this is where i want to i want to invest in great companies building um, you know amazing solutions to things but at the same time i was kind of looking around and you can't help but get frustrated or feel a kind of sense of I don't know, foreboding from, you know, in some of the, some of the problems in the world, when you look at, you know, unavoidable things like climate change, biodiversity loss, I think biodiversity loss, especially for me is the most, uh, it's one of the most painful to, to think about because I, I love nature. I just always have, and I'll go for a walk and I, I can drive my wife crazy sometimes because I'll just stop and like look at something I've never seen before. And she'll be like, what are you doing? And I'll be like, oh, have you seen this, you know, flower? Have you seen this thing? And she'll be like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> We're like everyone. So I've just always been, you know, fascinated by that. I watch all the kind of, you can't help but watch the incredible stuff David Attenborough produces and all of that. And if you start looking into it, then you also can't help but feel devastated about the impact uh, um, that, that that's happening there, right? So and then you've got inequality, right? How is it that we've built so much value? So basically in the last 200, uh, sorry, 200 years, we've made incredible progress. It's easy to feel like, you know, the world is um, kind of getting worse, but actually it's getting, you know, from a statistic perspective, now is the time to be born. It's, there's never been a better time, time to be alive on earth. We've never had it so good. Um, from extreme poverty to basic education, child mortality, democracy, everything has improved. But in that last 200 years, we've gone from 1 billion people to 7.9 billion people. And it's really been our, our approach or our mindset that the, 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 the you know, post-war, it was all about growing as much food as we could to feed all these, you know, for, feed everybody and optimizing everything for yield. And, you know, you mentioned this thing around finance, you know, finance, you look at, you have always looked at risk reward. It's just like, a, what's the risk and what's the reward? And like, what are the tools that we're using to measure that? So you have things like IRR and DCF, like discounted cash flow. That is a tool to, that a an investor uses to say whether or not you know this is a good payback. This is something that's worth investing in. But millions of, of professional investors are using a tool which completely ignores planetary conditions or planetary right. boundaries, right? Right. Right. Because we don't currently or haven't been looking at risk reward impact. We've we, you know there's no balance sheet entry for natural capital as it stands, like for nature and for the effects that you know mankind are having on it. Although there is amazing work being being done in that area, but how can that be? How can it be that we're still using a, a kind of model or models that just don't that are kind of accelerating how we kind of get ourselves in, into a real mess? So I was getting to the point where I felt like, look, I can't. If I do, if I do another VC job uh, or, or, you know, move into something else, how can I continue to, to do that without when I'm going to be in direct conflict with my own values and with my own potentially in direct conflict, like lots of things you invest in are actually, you know, can be, you know, very positive. But the point is, if we know that climate change, you know, is happening, if we know biodiversity loss is happening, and if we don't you know, apply that as part of our thinking, as part of our, uh, you know, uh, approach as an investor, then I think we're going to be missing out on one of the biggest opportunities there's ever been. If you yeah. look at, um, you know, the performance of Tesla and things like that, the reason Tesla stock is worth so much really was because they went early into electrification and, and all, this all this money that's coming from the capital market side down into things that have ESG alignment is allowing, um, you know, tremendous amount of, of investment to take place in things that are seen to be or are improving or, or leaning towards the SDGs. So 
if you if you kind of go down from those big companies down to the small that that you know I like working with, it's actually companies that I believe companies that are addressing you know our biggest societal challenges and making money and have you know good sound teams and business models. Why I mean it's obvious that they are going to um, be able to to grow faster as consumers and investors start to value nature as part of their equation or or think about um impact beyond you know just buying a pair of sneakers now you think oh okay i'll buy a pair of sneakers but i'd like to have a bit of information about them because i want to be a good consumer right. i don't right. <laughs> so and, and once you start doing that then all the direction of travel is going to be in working out well how do i get ones which are made out of like algae as as the base instead of as uh, uh, you know plastic as the sole and, and, and crazy stuff like that, because it's, it's kind of a natural, uh, natural process. So for me, you know, I read Donut Economics a couple of years ago. I then got very interested in regenerative leadership and, and um, regeneration in, in general. And what that means is that, you know, regeneration is really about building companies or regenerative companies are trying to do good as well as do well. And, and you've had a number of them. In fact, most of them are, you know, on, on your show. And I feel like the SDGs are a great step for big companies, but there's t- just tons of um, people who, who understand that we need to do more. And, you know, in the sort of pursuit of economic growth over the last, you know, 200 years, as I was saying, like we've now crossed, I think, five of the nine planetary boundaries that, that um, the Stockholm Resilience Centre, you know, outlined by the way that, you know, land systems change, things like that. And if we kind of keep going at the business as usual, usual speed, then we're going to achieve, I think, 10 and a half of the SDGs by 2030, when the goal was to reach all 17. And we're only going to re- um, reach 11 and a half by, um, by 2050, right? And in 2050, well, we need to be doing a heck of a lot better than that. So we all need to up our ambition because $44 trillion of uh, value, basically half the world's economic output is moderately or highly dependent on nature. And we eat every day, not really thinking about nature, but we are nature and we need, we need the support of pollinators and all this kind of stuff to, to make sure that we're all fed and fat and happy um, in, in 2050, because 2050, you know, isn't very far away. So, so yeah, I, I think that kind of process of research and post, process of learning, I then came across regenerative companies. I came across companies, you know, in every field, in every industry, You've got people who are moving much faster on this journey and others, you know, probably incumbents often, you know, they, they, they get, they're kind of moving as, as fast as they can or as fast as their ambition is. But the fantastic thing about entrepreneurs and disruption and, and financing it as an angel or a beta or as a venture capitalist is that we can accelerate brilliant companies by, by through investment. We can help them grow faster. And I think we're going to, you know, see an explosion of this. Like we're going to see this really start to take off. And I think, you know, right now we're talking about sustainability. I think in five years time, we're all going to be talking about regeneration because why can't Apple do as much good as an apple tree? It sounds like <laughs> a kind of silly thing, to, a silly thing to say, but like, I mean, they're making tremendous steps as a business, um, but obviously they have to mine or they, they're using, you know, there's incredible rare resources and things that are in our smartphones, et cetera. But if you look at the value that nature is giving back all the time, it just outweighs what companies with incredible resources are, are able to do. So I think, I think we will get to a point where companies are, are being judged and are being, you know, a product is being bought by somebody but because they are aligning to those values of coming from that, those entrepreneurs. When you talk to, whether it's other investors or, you know, leaders or executives or founders globally, mm-hmm. do you think that everybody is thinking this way or in a, or, or in a similar path? Is other parts of the world that are ahead of other parts of the world? Because like I look at it from a, mm-hmm. you know, a Western lens, which is a, a philosophy right in itself. And then you know, you're an Eastern sort of part of the world and specifically Southeastern. Like w- when you talk to people just like globally, like, are there philosophy differences on how to attack this? The environments are different in, in a way. So you will have 
actually, you know, one of the things regeneration about uh, regeneration is about is understanding place, right? You could have, I don't know, a tree, certain trees grow in certain places, right? You don't want to put the wrong tree in the wrong place. We'll just have a monocrop of a tree because right, it creates, right. uh, so, you know, let's say you've got, you know, one that creates a, or absorbs a lot of carbon, you know, so man, sort of old sort of control system thinking, industrial machine thinking would say, hey, let's put a ton of this one there you know in in a field because it, it absorbs most co2 but actually what regeneration is about is understanding nature and how it works and working in harmony with it so we can't we can't replicate a rainforest as well as a rainforest because it's all those different biodiversity those different things that are interacting in the soil and like the fungi is connecting in with the tree so there's first of all there's a whole world of stuff that we haven't really embraced or really understood beyond sort of very niche areas like regenerative agriculture that if we open our mind to it's it's very empowering because we start to think in solutions um, that are very long term and that are, can can enable us to have a much more resilient uh, resilient future that's much more aligned to society etc on the whole I think all entrepreneurs and investors have similar goals and are looking at their their regional landscapes so of course silicon valley you know is just a well-known you know it's most well known for for vc of course but there's tons of silicon valleys now there's tens of them uh, okay they might not be exactly the same scale but in in different cities around the world you've got major hubs for innovation what's interesting is you see obviously some places focusing on in, uh, impact okay fewer but you know you see a lot of fintech in some cities you see you know, um, a food tech and other things. And so for each place, you've kind of got a hotspot for, uh, or some places you have a hotspot of innovation around a specific thing. And that's the community side, right? That's kind of, you end up, the great thing about it is you end up creating a community around a, a, a specific industry or, or concept. And what we need now is just like for in, impact. I, I think the good thing is that if you look at the big, any big company right now will have pretty much a sustainability officer or have someone going, oh my yep. God, like yep. there is so many things that we need to, we need to do. And depending on, you know, what kind of a company you are, your, the challenges are, could be, you know, quite massive, but the opportunities are also massive as well. So, you know, if you're able to move more quickly, if you're more adaptive, more responsive, if you can work with suppliers and, and things to move more radically in a certain direction, you can win swathes of customers because your, your businesses, the businesses are starting to say, oh, can you tell me your ESG credentials? Because actually it, it's all flowing into my business. So I need to understand, you know, your employment practices and I need to understand your value chain and all this kind of stuff. So, so we're on that journey now. That is happening. So I think overall i would say that of course communities people have different beliefs have different maybe different um specific local specific inclinations most entrepreneurs are actually global thinking and most investors have to have to think in in the same terms i mean if you think about singapore five million people it's it's a tiny place really it's it's um incredible powerhouse for for that kind of size but a lot of business to consumer type offerings that are developed here that they their first thought has to be to go somewhere else because you know if you're in silicon valley you've got hundreds of million millions of people i guess in in us that you can you can sell your product to you know if you're in singapore you you've got five million people so you're going to always think oh how do i get into indonesia right. or how do i get into you know where's next or whatever but it but singapore is a significant place when it comes to attracting funds and attracting um capital um and it's got a lot of credentials that and a lot of work going into kind of fostering more of <clears throat> more creativity and more kind of fun management and, and things here and in the short time I've been here I, I think in I'm trying to think when it was but maybe when I arrived I think in 2014 around that time there was sort of 17 fintechs maybe in Singapore and it now has <laughs> the biggest fintech event globally uh, uh, it's just a ridiculously big event of course we haven't had it for a for a couple of years well we have well, had it online but it's not quite the same so you know i think what we need is actually more more joined up thinking more collaboration between cities 
and between um, investment clusters and between entrepreneurs. Because, I mean, just listening to your podcast, you're going to get tons of ideas, right, from different founders. And then, then if you zone into something you're super interested in, you know, maybe it's like food, food or food tech or cellular or whatever, then you've got like a whole wealth of stuff as well. So you, you, you always have to kind of go global and say, well, what's out there? Like what, right. who, who are really smart in these areas and learn from them and, and discuss because we've actually got a shared vision here. We've actually, I think one, the old mindset is like very competitive, you know, you're, there's your competitor, okay? But also at the same time, you could be hugely complementary <laughs> and addressing completely different markets. And the overall pie is uh, when I say pie, like the kind of opportunity, the market opportunity around that is growing, you know, at like a massive compound annual growth rates, like really big. So actually we can all move these things forward by, by, you know, domain and knowledge sharing. Yes, of course, there's going to be competition between investors over opportunities. And yes, there'll be competition between businesses. But I think that one of the things I've loved about starting to get you know, more into this space is there seems to be more collaboration. There's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of, you know, it's extremely rewarding, enjoyable to, to just have positive news, <laughs> like, or to, to see the, the steps that we're taking is really inspiring from, from, okay, initially quite humble, small companies, but they're able to scale like incredibly quickly. And it took, I think, seven years from when jo John F. Kennedy said, hey, we go, to the, we go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard and all that kind of stuff. It took about seven years to get man on the moon. Pretty unbelievable when you think about the technology right. that they had right. at the time. So, you know, we're eight years now from 2030. And I'm seeing money pouring into impact in all sorts of, you know, different guises. And it's going to accelerate. You know, it was... I think it's like 12x in the last four years that the, the, the value is now 1.6 trillion, according to Dilrim, of uh, impact companies out there. Last year was like 39 billion of investment in impact. So we're kind of at an inflection point where uh, I think last year alone, 38% of Fortune 500 companies have made stronger commitments or, or science-based target commitments or net zero. You know, if you look at that, we're, we're on a, a kind of exponential logarithmic type scale, right? Where we're every, everybody is getting their, their, their mindset or working out how to kind of overcome some of these things and, and not operate in this new paradigm. And that is going to be like having gone through BlackBerry and having gone through .com or whatever, the rate we can change now with machine learning and with space tech and with all the other things that, that we have is, is just unbelievable. And it's going to blow us away. It's going to, um, and what, you know, I want to be part of that community and I want to be helping, helping um, basically drive that agenda moving forward. Because I think, you know, if I look back 20 years from now, I'm going to look back favorably and say, Hey, that was a, that was a good, that was a good move because it's aligned actually to, you know, my personal beliefs. And, and, you know, if I can help invest in things, which also, you know, leave, leave a positive footprint, if you if you like on the world handprint, <laughs> I should say, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, then that's more of a legacy than becoming a billionaire and, and, you know, creating a rocket flying to, uh, flying to space to realize it's fragile and then setting up a fund. I'm not mentioning anyone right. in particular, right. but I, I kind of laugh when I, when I, you know, the, the old mindset, which was like, make a ton of money, become a billionaire, and then be philanthropic. It, it's not going to cut it anymore. Companies can make money and also be regenerative. They can make money and they can make the environment better and they can make societies better. And this is a whole different paradigm. This is a whole different opportunity. And I, I do think, I've been lucky in my career, you know, picking waves, like catching a wave. Um, you want to kind of like, and I just can't think of a bigger wave coming than, than what's happening now. So, so, you know, part of it is through how much I care about it. And part of it is because it also, you know, is just going to make obvious um, economic sense to be doing things that are good for the planet. Amazing, my man. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time. I am more than excited to kind of get started on, you know, our path of, of doing episodes together and you kind of, you know, doing um, episodes yourself when you can, because you interact with a with a ton of different people that I can't, right, just because of the time zone stuff. But like, sure. you know, in our conversations, I'm like, we, we, we need to record these conversations you're having, you know, <laughs> when, when, it, when, when enabled, right, when, when it's okay to do so, you know, because there's just so, like you said, there's, 
there's so many interesting companies, brands, founders, investors globally around the world, introducing more and more people to these type of individuals, these type of companies and brands. I think it's all of our mindsets shifting a little bit on what's possible, right? And, and what we can do yeah. day to day, right? That this, this is always a struggle, I think, with all of us is like, you know, I want to live my life. I want to do what I do. But you, you also, it's like, you still want to do, you know, good, I think by people yeah. and by your friends, by your families, by like, by, you know, your local community, your local nature, like, there's all these things that I think we all want to do, but they're like, very difficult, or we think they are very, very difficult. And I think everybody that I talk to and interact with, like, they're working on making doing good, a lifestyle that is easier to do, right. And I think that is the shift that if we can live our lives normally, but even but, but by just living lives normally, we're doing good. Yep. That is a transformational thing that yeah. is slowly occurring. And for, for, the, for you, I think, uh, or for us all, it will just get easier because companies will be taking decisions all the time that, that means that we don't have to think about a lot of this stuff, right? Like at the moment, it's like you have to think about to the point where you're worried about buying Q-tips for your ear because it's got a small piece of plastic <laughs> like in the middle and you're looking right. for like a, a right. more alternative version or, um, you know, all the way down to every single thing you're buying, you, you're having to kind of use a lot of your cognitive energy if you really care about the planet. And we need companies to step on and, and step up and, and make it a lot easier for us so that we know like, you know, I'd love to see no more plastic bottles. I'd love to see, you know, uh, a different material that just decomposes rather than just us all going round and round in circles, pretending that recycling is going to, you know, kind of increase and stuff. And we know that, you know, we're not meant to be drinking out of plastic, really. It's just been convenient. It's, it's kind of evolution from, from, you know, what we had. I'm extremely, you know, cognizant of the incredible body of interviews that you've created. So I really hope that I can ask good questions and shut up and allow these uh, fantastic people that I come across to, to share their stories and share their um, inspiring businesses with your listenership. And so it's with great care and stewardship that I try to uh, try to carry on in the same vein as what you've been doing, Gran, and hopefully everybody, you know, um, get used to my voice um, and, and, um, you know, what's cool is that we can actually really increase the numbers and types of shows that, that go out so that more yeah. of, the, of these real stars, the, the founders who are creating these incredible companies, find an audience and, and can, you know, connect with people. Because, yeah, I, I think even just by listening to the show, hopefully it's inspiring um, for people and opening their eyes to like different ways and, and, and means of doing, you know, doing things. And we can, we can change the world basically. Um, and we will change the world through kind of collaborating and working together and, and, you know, policymakers, corporations, they're part of how we got here and they're going to be yeah. part of how we get to where we need to be. So that for me is